welcome everybody gathered across all of our locations. And those of you joining us online, wherever you may be tuning in from around the world, we're thrilled that you're here. If you have a Bible, go ahead and find John 15. John chapter 15 is the passage that we're going to walk through together today. Um, when uh, Lindsay and I were first married, uh, the first place that we moved into was a little uh, rental home that her grandparents owned. And, uh, you know, it was just a modest little home. It's barely a thousand square feet if you held your breath. And uh, we had to do a little bit of work um, to, in order to move into that house because the previous uh, tenants had neglected it. Uh, and that's kind of putting it mildly. And so uh, when we, you know, got the keys and were ready to move in, we, you know, we had to tear out the carpet. And I had to rent a, a, a tiller and till up the yard and reseed it because it was so bad. And when I did, I dug up all kinds of interesting things. Um, chicken wire, Miller Lite cans, a Leonard Skinner t-shirt. So this begins to kind of tell you a little bit about the people that uh, lived there uh, before us. But uh, maybe the most disturbing thing I had to do was I had to get a power washer, uh, not for the outside of the house, which is where you normally use a power washer, but for the inside. And uh, the um, cabinets and the drawers uh, were so bad because of a ongoing neglected cockroach problem. And uh, I know this is disturbing, uh, probably a little bit too much information, but the only way to get rid of these like cockroach carcasses was to power wash them out. Like it was gnarly, it was wild. But we had to do some work in order to, to, to move in, you know, and make this ours. Now, since that time, thankfully, you know, we've uh, moved into a number of apartments and homes over the years. And uh, it's never been that bad, but we've always had to do at least a little bit of uh, cleanup, renovation, redecorating in order to make the home Hours. And you've likely had to do that as well if you've ever moved into a dorm room, an apartment, a house. And the changes can range from, you know, small, like maybe it's just a fresh coat of paint or some new furniture or some fixtures, or maybe um, big changes, like you got to knock out a wall or have a kitchen island rebuilt because the previous owners decided to steal it and take the island with them. True story. I think the island needs to stay with the home, but they... Didn't think so. Now, uh, in, in any case, there's always some, uh, you get the keys, you own the property, there's some renovations, some redecorations that need to be done to make it yours. Now, I say all that to say this. Did you know that when the Bible speaks about the place in which God lives, that, that God describes you as his house? Check out 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19. It says, do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit, who is in you, whom you have received from God. You are not your own. You were bought at a price. Now understand in, in the Old Testament, the place where the spirit of God resided was a place called the temple. But then after Jesus, the spirit of God no longer resides primarily in a temple or a cathedral or a sanctuary or a church building of any kind. It resides in in his people, in individuals. And so God's spirit is here, not because this place is any more sacred than any other, but because God's people are here. So God decides to move into you. So here's the gospel message. The gospel is that you and I come to the end of ourself. We recognize our sin and rebellion. We turn to God, we confess the sin, we repent of it, we invite Jesus into our lives, not just as Savior, but as Lord. God purchases our redemption through the blood of Jesus, and then it's move-in day. The Spirit of God shows up with a U-Haul truck, and he wants to move into your life. Now, now, with all that in mind, here's the question. Would God be comfortable to move into your life as is? Or is there some demo work that needs to be done? Is there some renovation or some redecorating that needs to take place? Now, I want to be really clear about this. I don't want you to misunderstand that God purchased your salvation. There isn't anything you bring to the table, no down payment that you make. He purchases you as is. I've talked to a number of people over the years that, that assume that they can't come to God until they know more or until they do more, right? You know what, I got a bunch of stuff I got to clean up in my life and then I'll come to God. And that's just silly. It's like, you don't, that's like saying, you know what, I got to clean the cup up before I let God clean the cup up. No, you just bring the cup to God as is and he signs the deed, you are his. He purchased you by his blood. And we are all fixer uppers, by the way. 
All of us are fixer-uppers. Romans 3 says nobody is righteous, not even one. And so just like when you purchase a house, your name is on the deed. God signed his name. You are his. And now he goes to work in the words of that great book by Dallas Willard, to renovate your heart. And that's a lifelong process of just renovation and knocking a wall down and redecorating. And, and here's the words, it's lordship and it's sanctification. Now, many of us, like, we love the idea of Jesus as savior. Of course, man, save me from my sins. Save me from my difficult circumstances. But he also says, I wanna be Lord of every room in your house. That's hard. How many of you have that room in your house? Um, you know the room. It's where you throw all the stuff whenever you know you have guests coming over. You have that room? It's like that closet, that attic, that basement. You know, it's like just throw in the house looks pristine. Just don't go in that room. You know, you open up that door, it's going to be an avalanche. We, we've all got that in our hearts as well. And we're like, you know, God, you can have all these rooms. Just stay out of that one. That's mine. God, can you please stay out of my bank account? Can you stay out of my bedroom? Those are the things that I want to do. And 1 Corinthians 6 says that you are not your own. You were purchased at a price. God owns it all. All right, so I say all that to, to simply say this. When it comes to the reno work, the, the demolition work, the, the cleanup that needs to be done, how does that get accomplished? Because I say some of that to you, and some of you are going, oh, man, I got, I got a lot of work I've got to do. R wrong. This isn't work that you can do. And that brings us up to, to John 15. Now, if you're just now joining us, last week we started a series called Red Letter Talks. We are gonna be in this all the way up through Easter. And what we are doing is we are looking at, uh, in the Gospels, some of the red letters. Now, the red letters are the words that Jesus spoke directly himself. So these are conversations he had. These are messages he preached. Uh, these are things that came directly out of his mouth. You might be like, okay, well, what's the difference between that and the other stuff? Well, the Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are biographies of Jesus' life. And so these are the things that Matthew, Mark, and Luke, they either saw or heard Jesus say and do, or they talked to others who saw him uh, say and do these things, and they're recording that. The red letters are the words directly from Jesus. The reason why it's so important to read the red letters is if you want to know what God would say, look at the red letters, because Jesus is God in the flesh. And so uh, we're kind of going through this. Last week we were in John 14. John 14, 15, and 16, in the Gospel of John, the, these passages are known as the final discourse. What that means is these are the final conversations that Jesus is having with his closest followers, his disciples, before his crucifixion, resurrection and ascension into heaven. These are some of the primary things he wants them and us as well as disciples to know and to apply to our lives. So last week we're in John 14, Jesus got the disciples in the upper room. They're sharing the Lord's Supper. He says something astounding to them. He goes, hey guys, guys, I'm getting ready to go away. You're gonna do the same things I've been doing. And then he one-ups it. He goes, you're gonna do even greater things than these. And last week I said greater things is a reference to salvations. It's a reference to conversions. People seeing their lives change, moving from darkness into light. And we've just seen that through history. There have been more people become Christians in the last 150 years than the previous 2000. That we've, we're seeing these awakenings and there's a spirit right now of fear and division and anger and anxiety. And at the same time, we can feel God on the move, directing people's hearts more and more towards him. So those words of Jesus are coming true even greater things. And he says this to the disciples. Now, as we come to 15, if I'm one of the disciples, I'm thinking to myself, okay, how are we gonna do these greater things? And so they leave the upper room. They're walking to the Garden of Gethsemane. It's the cool of the evening. And they walk past some ancient vineyards that have been producing fruit for decades. And this prompts a metaphor that Jesus is going to use that is so vivid and helpful for us in our understanding of whose job it is to renovate our heart and to produce some fruit in and through our lives. And so let's look at these red letters of Jesus. I'm just going to read the first eight verses of chapter 15. Jesus says, I am the true vine and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. 
remain in me as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine. You are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If you do not remain in me, you are like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire and burned. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. This is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. Jesus says, I am the vine. Now, if you study that metaphor throughout scripture, you'll find that that metaphor was used often in the Old Testament to describe God's people, the Israelites, but it was often used as a rebuke. So God would say to the Israelites, you, are, you guys are like a vine that bears no fruit. And the disciples would have been very familiar with that passage of scripture. And so when Jesus uses it, they would have understood the indicting metaphor. But something changes when Jesus uses the metaphor. Jesus says, no, no, I'm the vine. And they would have immediately picked up on that. That something had changed. In other words, Jesus is going, you're not the vine. I'm the vine. It didn't work before when you tried to be the vine. The Israelites tried to be the vine for decades and they couldn't produce any fruit. I'm the vine. Well, what's that mean? Well, that means that Jesus wants to do for you and me what we can never do on our own. He wants to accomplish in you what you could never do. He wants to produce some fruit in your life that you haven't been able to grow on your own. Okay, so he's the vine. What do we do? You're the branch. Just be the branch. Well, what do branches do? Branches only have one job. Stay connected to the vine. Well, what does that mean? Well, let me just give you a a couple of suggestions here to, to jot down some notes to reflect on this later. Being the branch means, first of all, Finding significance in who I am, a better way of saying that is who I now am in Jesus Christ, not what I do. So he just told them in the upper room that they were going to do the same things he had done, even greater things than these. And so how are they going to do these greater things? Now, Jesus nowhere in the passage says, okay, guys, huddle up. Here's how you're going to do these greater things. I've actually gone to the liberty of developing five-year strategic plans for each one of you. Based upon your Myers-Briggs, your disc profile, your strength finders, it's all cross-correlated with your Enneagram number and your wing. All right? And if you can just kind of follow this strategic plan to a T, then you're going to find your life's purpose and you're going to fulfill the Great Commission and there'll be a nice little bonus for you at the rapture. No, Jesus didn't say any of that. That, That's what we do. That's what we say. Here's what Jesus says. Here's how you're going to do these greater things. Understand your role. I'm the vine. God's the gardener. You're the branch. Just be the branch. Oh, okay, okay, I think I got it. But what's that mean? Well, it means that success and significance in your life is not based just on what you do, but it's who you're connected to. And our focus oftentimes within the church, sometimes tragically, especially within the church, and in our individual walks with the Lord, our focus has a tendency to be on doing, but Jesus keeps putting the emphasis back on Being. And can I just say to you right now, can I just confess to you that as your pastor, that this is the part of the message that I wrote specifically for me. Now, if it helps the rest of y'all, that's great. But this is primarily for me because what you need to understand about me as your pastor is um, uh, I'm in recovery. I'm an addict. I am addicted to accomplishment, progress, and productivity. Here's how bad the sickness has gotten. The night before I go to bed, I usually pull out a to-do list. I've actually got an app for that. And I pull out my to-do list and I create a to-do list for the following day. 
And um, by the next evening, I, I'm actually, um, my, my, my sense of worth, value, and identity more closely is tied to the clearing of that list than at what I would like to admit. And so the next night, I'm just kind of look at the, the day. I look at my list. I look at the calendar and I determine my worth. I determine my value. Uh, I determine, um, you know, how, how good I am by what I got done. So I want to know, like, how many emails did I return? Uh, how many decisions did I make? How many words did I write on my sermon? How many uh, errands did I run around? How many uh, projects did we get completed? Um, what did I accomplish today? And if it was a good day and I cleared the list, I want a little recognition for that. I'm like a dog. I roll over and I'm like, oh, come on, rub my belly. Rub my belly. Like, just tell me how good I did. Oh, that feels, that feels so, so good. And it's, it's a sickness. That's vine life. It's finding my worth in my ability to produce. But branch life is prioritizing connection over production. Now, some of you, some of you fellow, um, you, know, uh, you know, accomplishers, or could I say addicts, you're pushing back on me right now. You're like, what's wrong with production? What's wrong with to-do lists and clearing the list? You've even got a Bible verse for that. Doesn't it say, go to the ant, you sluggard? Like a Proverbs talks about hard work. I had somebody come up to me in between services out in the lobby and they're like, hey, can you tell me what app you use? As a, oh, 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 it's like, hey man. You're like, what's wrong? And there's nothing wrong with production. There is nothing wrong with hard work. We've got to make sure we get the order right. You don't produce so that you're worthy and have value and an identity so that you'll get connected. You connect and then you let God do the production through you. That is fundamentally different. So, so here, I'll just give you an example from my life and then you can contextualize it to yours because uh, I'm, I'm, you're just gonna have to contextualize it to what you do. So for me, I've set a deadline every week, Wednesday at noon, I've gotta have the, the message for the weekend done. There's a number of reasons for that because as domino effects, the production needs my notes, worship needs my notes, discipleship needs my notes to do all the things they're gonna do. I also like to have the, the message done a few days in advance just to let it marinate. And so uh, noon on Wednesday, when it, now this creates a lot of pressure on Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday morning. And so here's what has a tendency to happen is I wake up really early in the morning, I'll get my cup of coffee and I need to spend some time connecting to the vine, but I'm too busy preparing a sermon. I'm too busy preparing words from God to give to you that I don't have time to connect to the vine. How jacked up is that? God, I'd love to spend time with you, but I gotta speak for you in a few days. <laughs> and here's one of the things that I've like kind of noticed is that oftentimes like getting up on this platform is like, I, I don't know what's gonna happen. Sometimes I'll step, and, and here's the thing, please don't hear me say that you, you, I shouldn't prepare because I believe that the Holy Spirit can work in preparation just as much as in the moment. But what I will say is that oftentimes I'll get up here and sometimes it's like riding a lightning bolt and sometimes it's like riding a dead donkey. And I'm like, I don't know what's going on here. Like nothing's happening. And so, so if you, uh, a week and a half ago at worship night, if any of you were here, I had no idea what I was going to say. I, I knew that they'd given me a time to jump up on the platform to say something. And I got up and most of that was impromptu from the hip in a spirit kind of led moment. I actually went back and watched it for the first time uh, yesterday. It was the first time I'd seen it. I don't even remember saying a lot of those things. Like it was just one of those like Holy Spirit, whoa, riding a lightning bolt kind of moments. I didn't prepare any of it. And I had a number of you come up to me and say, that was the best message we've ever heard you preach. And I was like, shut up. I work hard every week, man. And see, this is what I'm talking about. It's this idea of focusing on connection and letting Jesus the vine do the production through you. And so it's not, production itself isn't a bad thing. And all the non-productive people, amen, say more of that, right? It's, like, it's about making sure we get the order right. It's not production, then connection. It's connection, then production. Look back at verse one. Did you notice that Jesus uses a qualifying word before he says vine? Look at your Bibles. What does he say? He says, I am the true vine. And that's an indication that there are imitation vines that are out there. And there are, a, we're, here's the thing. You're a branch, whether you are connected to God or not. 
The question is, what are you connected to? And so all of us are connecting ourselves to something that we think will give us worth and fulfillment and value and purpose. The question is, is it a real vine or is it an imitation vine? And these imitation vines, it could be something that's destructive, maybe an addiction or maybe uh, an unhealthy uh, desire for more. But oftentimes, though, the thing that we're connected to, this imitation vine, it's not a bad thing. It can actually be a really good thing, but what makes it bad is we turn it into a God thing. The Bible word for that is idol. The the action form of this is worship. And whatever we're connected to, it could be a false vine. So a false vine could be something good like your career, your work. A a false vine could be um, money. It it could be um, sex and sexuality. Uh, uh, An imitation vine could be working out. Whatever it is that you're connected to that you think is your identity or the thing that gives you worth, value, and purpose, but it's an imitation vine that will either produce no fruit or imitation fruit or fruit that just simply doesn't last. So I've got up here uh, with me um, a vine with a couple of clusters of grapes, some fruit. And at a distance, you may not be able to tell much of a difference between the two, but one of them is real fruit. Like I could pluck off a grape and eat it and it'd be real. And then another is imitation fruit. It's it's plastic. In fact, uh, uh, this one's the imitation. This one's real. This one almost even kind of looks a little bit better. Just its form. And if you look at it from a distance, you'd be like, oh man, they look the same. And see, I think oftentimes the world looks at Christians, those who say they follow Jesus, kind of like this. They're like, well, they they both look kind of the same, but one's connected to the vine authentically. One's connected to an imitation vine in the name of Jesus, but it's imitation fruit. And so the world gets up close to a Christian and then they taste what it is that you're offering, the fruit in your life. Remember the fruits of the spirit in Galatians. And they go, oh man, this is plastic and it's tasteless. And and they walk away from the church and say, "There's just they're just a bunch of hypocrites. Guys, that's what's at stake. That we connect to the true vine, not an imitation vine. And many of us, we settle for that. Look again at what it says in verse 2. Jesus goes on in the teaching. He says, he cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit. And then this next part is tough to hear. He says, while every branch that does bear fruit, what does he do? He prunes. Why? so that it will be even more fruitful. Now I can understand the first part, but that second is a difficult teaching. He says, for those of us who are bearing fruit, expect some pruning. And pruning comes in different forms. Pruning involves loss of some kind. Pruning involves the conclusion or the end of something that you perceive to be good. Why? Because it's bearing fruit. So it's a role that gets phased out. It's a program that gets cut. It's an opportunity that goes away. It's a relationship that ends. And pruning is always painful. And in the short term, it's very confusing. But Jesus says, please understand, God is the gardener and he prunes not to punish, not to stress you out, Uh, Not to, uh, it's it's not that he's, you know, distracted. He prunes so that you can bear more fruit in your life. That's the whole purpose of pruning. You don't prune things that are dead. You prune things that are alive so that they flourish even more. I was talking to somebody who knows a thing or two about vineyards. And they said, if you were to show up at a grape vineyard on pruning day, and to the untrained eye, you would perceive the pruning to be excessive. You would assume the gardeners were destroying the vines. They were cutting so much back. But he said pruning is essential for the juice of the, of the, of the fruit to be even sweeter. And then he, they even said this. The more stress you put on the branches, the sweeter the fruit. And that falls right in line with what Jesus says in this passage. I know some of you right now are in a season of pruning and it feels excessive and it feels painful and it feels like it will never end. And I want you to know that it's not because God is neglecting you or absent or punishing you. 
It's be, quite possibly it could be because he's the master gardener. He's playing the long game and he wants to see even fruiter, sweeter fruit from your life. So, so to recap from the passage, there's a few different kinds of branches. He says there's branches that are connected, but maybe it's a false vine or they're not really producing any sort of fruit. Then you got branches that are bearing fruit, but they get pruned. And then the last thing Jesus says, you got branches <clears throat> that are on the ground because they are no longer connected. You know, every spring, uh, I know that we're going to have some pop-up thunderstorms that are going to roll through and high winds and rain. And I always know every time one of those comes through in the spring that I'm going to have some cleanup to do because there are branches that were connected to my trees in my yard. They're going to break off and they're going to fall on the ground. And when a branch breaks off a tree and falls on the ground, it's no longer a branch. It's a stick. And I got to go through and I got to pick up the sticks. And I don't, it's kind of pretty tragic actually because you look at it and you see all the carnage after a thunderstorm. You can kind of see where that branch used to go, but now it's kind of like, well, you know, I I can't glue it back on. I'm not gonna tape it back up there. The only thing I can do is throw it in the brush pile that I burn a couple times a year, which is exactly what Jesus says here in the passage. But it wasn't that the storm caused the branch to fall off the tree because not all the branches did. Some of the branches were able to endure it. Some of the branches stayed connected. Now, what the strong, unexpected storm does is it reveals the strength of the connection between the branch and the tree. And when the storms come into your life, and by the way, they always come, the connection gets revealed. All the storm did was it reveals the strength of the connection. So when those branches fall, so I'm going to have some branches fall off my trees this spring that didn't fall off last spring. Because over the course of the last year, the connection's been getting weaker and weaker. There's maybe a rotting that's going on underneath the surface that just to the blind eye, you wouldn't be able to see, but it's there under the surface. And guys, the effect of that is what, how, what sin has on our lives. That you can look at somebody from the surface and go, man, everything kind of seen. Have you ever uh, uh, seen, heard of somebody who just kind of completely blew their life up? And you're like, what happened? Well, it, it had been there all along underneath the surface. See, sin that is unchecked or unconfessed weakens the connection between the branch and the vine. Sin that is scheduled and planned. Sin that continues to be justified and minimized. Uh, God will forgive me. It's what he does. I'm going to go ahead and do this. Well, you're weakening the connection between the branch and the vine. It's like an infection that spreads. See, most Um, stick stories that I know are stories that involve unexpected storms and unchecked sin. And then Jesus says at that point, like, what do you do? Like, what can you do? Sometimes sticks don't want to be branches again. So you just gather them up and you throw it into the pile. And he says that it's, it's thrown into the fire. Fire in scripture is a symbol of judgment and punishment. Jesus is not threatening us. He's warning us. Man, stay connected to me, abide in me, remain in me, be the branch. And remember uh, what he's saying this, he's doing this teaching on the way to Calvary, on the way to shedding his blood on a cross. Now here's why this matters. When Jesus died on a cross, he made a way for sticks to become branches again. He died so that what was once dead could live again. And some of you, maybe even today, you're like, you know what? There was a time in my life where I felt connected to the vine. I felt connected to Jesus, but a storm knocked me off or, or um, unchecked sin kind of severed my relationship. And man, my fruit bearing days are over. No, they're not. No, they're not. Because of the blood of Jesus, you can be grafted back in. I was reading this last week about something called grafting. And grafting is defined as a process in which one part of a plant is surgically connected to another so that they can become one plant. So apparently I can take those sticks and put them back on the tree. (laughs) And in grafting, here's what happens. Is the gardener, and who's the gardener in the passage? God. He will make a V cut or a wedge into the vine. In the passage, who's the vine? Jesus. All right, gold star. You guys are awesome. All right, so, so God the gardener, Jesus the vine. So, so the gardener will cut a, a V wedge into the vine, and then he'll take the stick, and he'll place it into that wedge and graft it in. And that process is called, get this, 
bleeding. So the gardener makes the vine bleed so that the stick can be grafted back in once again. And then he seals it with wax. And then what happens is the bleeding of the vine gives nutrients to the stick, turning it into a branch once again so that it can bear fruit. Guys, that is the gospel message. In Ephesians chapter one, it says, in him we have redemption through our bleeding savior. Because he shed his blood on a cross, we could be redeemed and reconciled and restored before a holy God. Romans chapter 11 says, we've been grafted into the family tree, that none of us deserve this. We've been grafted in. God is the God who works miracles. Jesus bled so that sticks could become branches once again. And today is the day where maybe you need to come to a realization of something in your life. I know that right now, whether you're at a physical location or whether you're watching online, maybe right now you're gonna finally see like scales falling from your eyes, what the gospel message is and what it isn't because you thought it was religion. You thought it was, I gotta be good enough for God to receive me and then keep all the rules. That's not what it is. You can be grafted into the family tree of God and all that Jesus wants you to be is just be the branch. And just be the branch. You stay connected to Jesus Christ. And so you can do that right now today, right where you are simply by recognizing there is a God and you're not him. And you are sin and in your rebellion, you've turned from God and now you're coming to him in confession and repentance and you're asking Jesus to be savior of your life, but also Lord of your life, which means you're gonna unlock that storage closet and let him in there too. And then now you, you allow him to do some renovation of your heart for the rest of your days on earth, preparing you for eternity. And that is called connecting to the vine. Uh, and right now there's somebody listening to this and you are receiving that for the very first time. You're asking Jesus to be Lord and savior. That happens right where you are in an instant in your seat. And I'm just trusting right now, somebody just moved from darkness into light. Somebody just moved from being severed from the vine to being grafted into the vine. And we're gonna celebrate that right now. Whoever you are, wherever you are, maybe you're at one of our uh, campuses right now. Maybe you're in your car on your way to work, listening to this later in the week. Maybe you're on the treadmill, you know, stop and pray, right? Don't hurt yourself, but th that's, that, that's, that's you right now. Uh, there's others of you though, you need to apply something different from this teaching. Some of you are realizing maybe, maybe you've been calling yourself a Christian, but you've been connected to an imitation vine. And there's a reason why you haven't been bearing fruit or been bearing authentic fruit is because you've, You've called yourself a Christian, but you're actually connecting to this thing over here. It's the reason why you're so scared to death about the election, not because what we, whoever we vote in there isn't important, but because that's actually become your functional savior. And so the spirit of God, say, the Bible says that, uh, that, that where the spirit of God is, there, there is no fear. The perfect love drives out fear. And so that could be an indication that's your imitation vine. For some of you, it's work. For some of you, it's that relationship. For some of you, it's your productivity, which is why anytime you get some feedback or criticism, you fall apart because that's an imitation vine. And you need to be connected to the true vine of Jesus Christ. Some of you right now are realizing you're still connected to the vine, but man, that connection is getting weaker and weaker and weaker because of unchecked sin. And today you need to always be confessing, always be repenting. Repentance isn't something that you did at church camp when you were a kid and became a Christian. Repentance is what you do every single day. Why? To strengthen the connection. Some of you have gotten out of the habit of coming to church. You're just like, well, I don't need to go to church every week to be uh, a Christian. Uh, that's true, but you need to be with uh, a collection of people because what we're doing right here is, is, is you strengthening the connection to the vine strengthening connection to the branch because I'm telling you, storms are coming. Storms are coming. And it will reveal the connection. Uh, some of you, maybe you've been broken off from the vine and you're wondering if there's a way for you to ever be connected again. And man, there is, there is. Jesus can graft you back into the family tree by his blood. All you gotta do is come home. And so right now, wherever you are, whatever you need to apply, whatever the spirit of God is saying, cause he's saying something to everybody. That's the genius of these red letters, is that Jesus knows what you need to hear and how you need to apply that to your life. So would you just take a few moments to do that? Just be, just be, just be.
remain in him. Father, we love you. Thank you for being the master gardener who knows when we need pruning, even if we don't want it. Thank you for sending us the vine, Jesus Christ, who by his blood reconciles us with you. Father, thank you that you're a God of miracles, that you can take sticks that are on the ground and graft them into the family tree so that fruit might be born through our lives once again. And so whatever it is that we need to hear, whatever the spirit of God is saying to each one of us, may we be open enough to just receive it and maybe just practice a little bit of what we've just heard, just to abide, just to be in your presence, to not race ahead too far into our day or the week that's coming up or the to-do list that need to be done. All that's there. We just wanna connect with you and allow you to do what only you can. We ask this in Jesus' name.